Welcome to Reimagining Liberty, a show about the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. I'm Aaron Ross Powell. On the one hand, we're told we live in a postmodern age. On the other, postmodernism is a notoriously challenging set of philosophical ideas to nail down and understand. But it's worth the effort. Because postmodernism, even if it gets some of its arguments wrong or overstates its case, is deeply interesting with genuinely valuable insights. To help me tease out just what postmodernism is and what we might learn from it, I'm joined by my good friend and frequent reimagining Liberty guest, Matt McManus. He's a lecturer in political science at the University of Michigan and author of many books, including The Rise of Postmodern Conservatism and the emergence of postmodernity at the intersection of liberalism, capitalism, and secularism. Let me very briefly mention that Reimagining Liberty is a listener-supported show. If you enjoy these discussions and want to get early access to new episodes, you can become a supporter by heading to reimaginingliberty.com. With that, let's turn to my conversation with Matt. We're talking today about postmodernism, but let's start with what is modernism? What is the thing that postmodernism is post? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, and if you ask you know, two people, you'll get three, probably four different answers, right? Um, I'll just give you two of them uh, that people usually see postmodernism as reacting against. Uh, one of them is modernity broadly, right? Which is a kind of sociopolitical term for, depending on how you want to date it, uh, the ideological shift that took place in the 16th, 17th century uh, from antiquarian and medieval ways of conceiving the world and conceiving society uh, towards those that are more liberal and modern, quite frankly, right? Uh, And, you know, people have different views on modernity and they align it with different social forces. Uh, Capitalism and secularism are two that are very prominent in the literature. Uh, But broadly speaking, uh, what seemed to characterize modernity for many uh, was this faith in big P progress, right? The idea that whereas, you know, in antiquity, society tended to move in, you know, the famous Aristotelian cycle, right? You know, reach a golden age, and then there was decline, and then there was, you know, fall, and then there was, you know, a resurrection or a new kind of society that emerged, and then, you know, another decline. Uh, it, for people in modernity, the expectation was rather like Steven Pinker that everything was just going to get better uh, over time. And you can see many different iterations of this, right? It comes in a lot of different flavors. Uh, So liberal modernists, if you wanted to, you know, characterize them like that from Kant through, you know, John Stuart Mill, you know, through to even somebody like John Rawls, for example, uh, would put forward this argument that, look, you know, older human societies were unfree, dominated by authoritarianism. Uh, Certainly, you know, the economy was nothing to write home about. Uh, And now because of a combination of technological innovation the exercise of human reason and emancipating people from the strictures of dogma and authoritarianism, uh, things are getting better. Uh, And there's also a Marxist tale that you can tell about modernity as well, which is, you know, we had an earlier mode of production, you know, feudalism that was characterized by all kinds of anti-rationalist and irrationalist theologies. uh, But capitalism has emancipated many people from those kinds of ideological illusions, albeit, you know, replacing them with its own. Uh, But, you know, in the long run, eventually people will rise up, uh, they'll overcome the limitations of capital, and then they'll produce a socialist society. And then, you know, the free development of each will be the precondition for the free development of all. And what does Marx say with Engels? Uh, you know, well, hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, and criticize in the evening without becoming, you know, hunter, fisher, uh, or critic, right? So these are both progressive narratives. They're emblematic, if you want, of, you know, this idea of modernity. The other way that it's been understood, uh, certainly in the aesthetic sphere, uh, is as a kind of art or artistic style. Uh, And this is a more narrow way of understanding it, but it's an important one. Uh, You think about people like, say, James Joyce, for example, right? Uh, So James Joyce had this very comprehensive, systematic view of the world uh, that he reflected in his literary works. Uh, And the idea was that art should represent the broader structures uh, in which people are embedded. Uh, And there was faith that human reason could apprehend those structures, and that should also be apprehended in art. Uh, Now, it's important not to be too strict here, since many forms of modern art anticipated many forms of postmodern art, right? Like, think about James Joyce, who was a huge influence on a variety of different postmodern literary figures, like Don DeLillo, who actually I'm very fond of, right? Thomas Pynchon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Or you could think about somebody like, say, Sigmund Freud, who was an immense influence uh, on a huge array of artists. Uh, Freud definitely argued uh, that it was possible for science, so-called, 
science psychoanalyst analysis to interrogate the deeper motivations behind human action and therefore explain them. Uh, but, you know, there's also a postmodern reading of him as showing that actually we're not these rational creatures. We're always driven by these unconscious motivations that are ultimately opaque to us. So aesthetically, right, uh, it's this faith that human reason can apprehend the structures, even the unconscious or unclear structures that determine us. Uh, that's emblematic in many senses of modernist art. Uh, and postmodernist art and aesthetics constitutes a break from that in certain kinds of profound ways. So is that related then to another divide that gets talked about in the context of postmodernism, which is between structuralism and post-structuralism? With it sounds like structuralism dovetails with a lot of what you just described about there are there are these structures and we can we can analyze them, we can understand them, we can figure we can figure out what's going on with them, see them at work in the world. We can have it's the structures we call it like a a science of signs, and and then the post structuralists and it seems and maybe this is just a point of clarification. It often seems like the terms post structuralism and post modernism either get used interchangeably or have so much overlap that it's not it wouldn't be a huge error to use them somewhat interchangeably. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, let's be careful here, right? Uh, I mean, when we refer to post-structuralism uh, and structuralism, those are more technical terms uh, than modernism and postmodernism. Uh, not that you can't use the terms modernism or postmodernism in a technical sense. You know, many people do, including me, right? But they've kind of become um, general or popular terms, uh, which are used in a wide array in you know the broader culture. Whereas, you know, if you were asked the average person on the street, you know, what are your thoughts on post-structuralism? They probably wouldn't have, you know, that much to say about it, and understandably, right? Uh, but broadly speaking, you're absolutely right. You know, uh, people like Ferdinand Saussure or the early Wittgenstein, um, you know, also an important influence on um, various modernists, right? Put forward this idea that we can have a science of signs or a science of language, right? Uh, and we can describe the way that language, often holistically, kind of hooks on to the real world uh, and paints a picture uh, of it. If you want to use again uh, the early Wittgenstein's, you know, famous metaphor. Uh, whereas, you know, post-structuralists start to become more skeptical that language can mirror the real world uh, in this way, uh, and they do so for a wide variety uh, of different reasons. Right? Uh, I mean, Derrida is very critical uh, of aspects of Saussurean linguistics, at the very least, uh, arguing that what's much more interesting than what language represents uh, are all the things that it represses, if you want, uh, in its attempt to represent at least a certain kind uh, of view of the world, right? Uh, or you could think of, in America, Richard Rorty, right, who is deeply influenced by a wide array uh, of modernist thinkers, uh, but is often associated with uh, postmodernism. He wrote a pioneering book in many ways uh, in the 1970s, um, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, which I'm sure many of your readers have heard of, uh, doing something very similar to what Derrida did in continental philosophy uh, to analytical philosophy, uh, where you know Rorty says there's this longstanding view in philosophy uh, that we have what he calls a glassy essence, right? That the fundamental feature of human consciousness, at the very least, is to represent or mirror the world in his famous metaphor. Uh, and language is another attempt to do that, right? You know, where you know we use words to try to again use Wittgenstein's term, paint a picture uh, of the world around us. Uh, and Rorty was very critical of this for a wide variety of you know different reasons. Uh, Heideggerian and late Wittgensteinian reasons for the most part. We don't need to get into it, right? But um, this view um, became pretty ubiquitous uh, for a little while. Uh, and I want to stress, I have serious problems with it, uh, but it can reach pretty rarefied intellectual heights uh, in a way that I'm not sure that sometimes uh, critics of postmodernism appreciate, because anybody who reads, for instance, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature wouldn't be of the opinion that Rorty just didn't know what he was talking about, right? You know, he was really well versed in analytical philosophy of language, analytical philosophy of mind. So it's a problematic book, uh, but definitely a worthwhile read. So we have we have this world where there are structures, they are intelligible, we can analyze them. And then we shift to a postmodern world or ethos or set of philosophies that says no. That that says these structures that that you thought were solid maybe aren't these structures that you thought were coherent contain internal contradictions um you have the you know derrida famously interrogating binaries and saying these the deconstructing the binaries so saying you know our language and our conceptual 
world is constructed around binaries between good and evil, male and female, nature and civilization, etc. Um, but if we look closely at these things, they start to they start to blur. They they start to become less clear, and and that a lot of this has an ideological perspective on it. That that this this clarity is in the service of ideologies. And and a lot of people react very strongly against these critiques. Yeah. Is this just radical skepticism or nihilism or or just are, are the postmodernists just basically throwing up their hands saying there's no reality, there's no objective reality, there's there's no progress, there's no actual knowledge, there's only language games and power relationships and so on. Is it just kind of a a philosophy of of rejection and giving up? No, I mean they never just say that, right? Uh in no small part because you know they're all intelligent and thoughtful enough to realize that you can't build a sustainable politics or even a sustainable way of living uh, on that basis, right? Uh, however, you know, I'm a critic of postmodern thought, and I would say that that does seem to be the conclusion that one would be led to dealing with their thoughts sufficiently, right? So let's just take Michel Foucault uh, as a good example, right? Uh, Michel Foucault is often painted as a nihilistic figure, right? Somebody who showcases that, you know, forces of discipline and power are operative everywhere. Uh, and so, you know, the best that we can do is, you know, resign ourselves to them. Uh, actually, you know, in his later work, Foucault developed, you know, uh, an ethics of the self, if you want to call it that, uh, endorsing various forms of self-creation that were inspired by, let's just call it probably a left-wing kind of Nietzschean uh, view, right? Uh, he never really kind of unpacked that all that thoroughly. Um, but then again, you know, he died early from AIDS, unfortunately, right? So we never got his systematic ethics, if you want to call it that. Uh, but, you know, this is a relatively small part of his work next to all the deep gloomy, uh, often very dark and pessimistic ruminations on power. And even though he endorses this idea uh, of a kind of ethics of self-creation, uh, he never really suggests how politically this would be achievable, uh, since he's often so willing to say that even a politics that looks emancipatory on the surface often contains within it the seeds of new forms of discipline or new forms of domination or new forms of subjectivization. You can you know use your terminology. Uh, so the conclusion that even, you know, people who are fond of Foucault, uh, like Thomas Lemke, come to, uh, is that it's very, very difficult to kind of construct a positive kind of outlook uh, from his work. You can do it, but it's hard, right? Uh, but before we kind of dive into this, I think it's just helpful to kind of be analytically clear here about the variety of different ways that one can understand postmodernism or postmodernity, right? Uh, oftentimes, it's critics kind of lump all of these together when actually they're quite discreet, right? So uh, in my work, I distinguish between two different ways of understanding postmodernism, uh, but you know, there are more, you know. Uh, so one of them is, again, as a kind of skeptical philosophical position uh, that raises objections to the idea that we can access let's just call it universal truth about ethics or epistemology or a wide variety uh, of philosophical areas. Uh, now, I'm not convinced by a lot of these skeptical arguments, and I want to make it very clear, uh, but some of them are quite sophisticated, right? Um, you know, if you read, for instance, the late Wittgenstein's uh, work on language uh, and the problem of representation, and, you know, the late Wittgenstein was a profound influence on many of these postmodern theorists. Uh, these aren't, you know, slight objections. They're things that people need to think through carefully, uh, and try to respond to them programmatically the way, say, somebody like Saul Kripke does uh, in his work on Wittgenstein, right? Uh, another way of understanding postmodernism that I think is more productive and more interesting, though, uh, is as what you might call a cultural condition, right? Uh, and this is the sense in which many Marxists, and I should also add many conservatives, use the term postmodernity. Uh, and this refers less to the writings of, let's say, esoteric French intellectuals who, you know, are raising new forms of skeptical arguments, uh, and more to an attitude or disposition that is engendered, depend, you know, in the postmodern world, right, uh, for a variety of different reasons, uh, where people are increasingly skeptical of what Leotard calls grand narratives uh, about projects, uh, sorry, about um, grand historical projects, right, uh, or meta narratives uh, about historical progress. Uh, and what's really interesting about this discourse around the culture of postmodernity uh, is 
mm-hmm. not just what its symptoms are, and everyone has a different kind of catalog of its symptoms, uh, but what its catalysts uh, or determinations are. And this is where you really start to see people disagree. Uh, because, for instance, conservatives will argue that the reason that postmodernity emerged uh, is because of deepening secularism, for example. Right? That's a very common argument made by people like, say, um, Peter Lawler. Right? Uh, it's this rejection uh, of the old Aristotelian scholastic worldview, uh, which leads to what he calls a kind of hyper-modern attitude, uh, that there's no purposes to nature, that everything uh, that is of value is just a matter of human subjectivity. Uh, and so consequently, what we need to do is go back uh, or recover a kind of Aristotelian to mystic outlook. Uh, and then, of course, you have various kinds of Marxist critics who will argue that really the roots of postmodernity are, surprise, surprise, capitalism, right? Uh, now, there are a lot of different arguments put forward to this, and we don't have to rehash them all. Uh, but let's just take a very simple one, right? So uh, many Marxists will say that, look, uh, what happens under capitalist conditions is the logic of the market tends to colonize a wide array of different spheres of life. Uh, including those that initially didn't seem subject to the logic of the market, right? Uh, and Marxists will say this includes our value system, for example. Uh, so just as, you know, when somebody goes to the market, uh, they will say, you know, really whether I buy Rice Krispies or Corn Pops is a matter of subjective taste. Uh, so too, people will come to say, well, whether I believe that Western civilization is the greatest civilization in the world, or I want to convert to fundamentalist Islam, uh, there's no way of arguing for which of these is better in some kind of abstract or metaphysical sense. It's just a matter of taste, right? Uh, and Marxists will claim that this is the result of these different logics or outlooks uh, that capitalism induces, uh, spreading themselves all through, if you want to use a technical term, the life world, right? Uh, and then, you know, you have liberals who will make their own kind of arguments uh, about where um, most modernity comes from. Uh, so the great philosopher Charles Taylor, great Canadian philosopher, should add, uh, argues that in older antiquarian societies, uh, let's take a village, for example, right? People had a significant number of what he calls sources of the self that help tell them who they are, right? You know, say you and I grew up in Nantucket, population 500, you know? You and I would probably know each other from, you know, the cradle to the grave. Uh, you know, you would be the blacksmith and I would be the butcher. It's using, you know, Adam Smith's terms. Uh, and, you know, we would be the blacksmith and the butcher because that's what our dads did. And we would know that that's what we were going to do when we would grow up. Uh, and we both attend the same church and, you know, we both believe the same things. Uh, and so there are these kind of stable value systems that enabled us, that enabled us to kind of know who we are. Uh, and Taylor would say that in postmodernity, which is really an extension of modernity in many senses, uh, we don't have those anymore. You know, you and I will go and live in big urban cities where there are wide catalog uh, of different communities that we could join, different value systems that we might embrace, different aesthetic styles that we might decide to adopt. Uh, and we might decide to experiment with any number of them over the course of our life. You know, I'm sure you went through, you know, a couple of different phases when you were a teenager, like I did, you know, thinking, well, maybe I'm a punk or maybe I'm emo or, you know, maybe, you know, I'm actually just a square. Who knows? Right. Uh, and Taylor would say, you know, in many ways, there's something valuable from this. Uh, because the dissolution of these traditional sources of the self means that I am more free to experiment with who I want to become. Uh, but there's also an alienation and a sense of anxiety that comes from that, right? Because there's a comfort in knowing that, well, I'm going to grow up to be the butcher or, you know, the blacksmith. Uh, that's my role in life. I'm going to marry the girl next door and I'm going to go to the church and that's going to be my life. Uh, having to choose, um, especially under, you know, these kind of extraordinarily rapidly changing conditions right now, uh, is frightening for a lot of people. Uh, so for somebody like Taylor, who's a, you know, a left liberal commentator on modernity and postmodernity, uh, it's a mixed blessing, right? And you know, we can go on and on and on, but uh, like I said, this is where I think the real action is uh, on the discourse around postmodernism, what's uh, most interesting and most intellectually substantial. As you were saying that, what, what occurred to me is, so I guess one of my reactions, I should say, to, to postmodernism and postmodern thinkers um, and and I have this reaction to a lot of the ideas that fall under the broader, you know, the, the kinds of things you learn when you take a lit crit or a literary theory class in so psychoanalysis, Marxism. Got to you know, ontologize the ontology of the presence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, the, those cat the category of philosophies that end up in that class as opposed to what you learn in a 20th century philosophy class in a philosophy department. Um, is that there's a lot of really interesting ideas. There's a lot of really interesting arguments that a lot of it is 
is intellectually engaging and exciting in a way that analytic philosophy is less so, especially when, you know, like I was as a 18 and 19 year old taking my first lit crit class in college just became obsessed. Like it's it, the, these ideas are like really exciting because they just seem to kind of upend everything and and explain or explain away lots of things. But you know, 20 some odd years later, my reaction is more some of this seems kind of like obviously true, but often it seems overstated. <laughs> That it's not it's not as true or universally true uh, as as the the people making these arguments claim it to be. And but one of the things, one of those like obvious truths that seems to fall out of a lot of this and in the incredulity towards meta narratives is first, yes, we should be incredulous towards meta narratives. Like I think that's just a healthier way to go through the world than being credulous in the face of particular meta narratives. But that one reason I wonder that this that we see this now um that we see this with the rise of global capitalism is not necessarily markets forcing their way into things, but rather Credulity towards meta narratives to a particular meta narrative, and to go to your Nantucket example, seems to depend on two things. One, that you don't have a lot of exposure to alternative narratives because then yours looks more solid if it's not just one among many. And two, that you don't see much in the way of change over the course of your life and the lives of the people before you. And so you can. You can come to believe that the particular meta narrative isn't a narrative, but is is just nature, is truth. You know, this is Roland Barthes' writing on mythologies speaks a lot to the the way that we kind of const- mythologies make natural what was kind of contingent narratives, um, and and that the modern world simply broke down those two things that were exposed. Technology exposes us to. The world outside of the immediate, you know, 10 square miles of our village in a way that historically was not the case at all. So now we're aware of what's happening in, you know, we can we can be really into pop music from Korea and animation from Japan, and we can know about the cultures of sub-Saharan Africa in a way that, you know, our ancestors did not. And and think the pace of change has just accelerated. And so we can see these people thought that this was the way things always were, but I've seen them change in my own life, and so the likelihood that they change again. Um, and and I wonder how much the the strong reaction against postmodernism that seems motivated often. You know, you can critique the arguments, but often it's more just like a a visceral. I don't like. Like even if their arguments are good, I don't. These conclusions that they have bother me deeply. Um, is is more just about their kind of the ones pointing out, look, this stuff that you thought was solid and insisted was solid. The, this these ideologies that you clung to and assumed were natural. Um, these myths in in the Barth sense, rather obviously, aren't. And and so kind of deal with it and then face the political repercussions of that which is that if they're not natural if they are contingent maybe you can't force them on other people. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to point out postmodernism as his name suggests has a kind of continuity with modernism. Uh that's important. And I think that this is one of the things that Marxists and conservatives have been especially adept at stressing that liberals sometimes resist uh but they shouldn't, right? Because one of the things that both modernists and conservatives will stress is look you cannot understand the emergence of postmodernity uh, with all of its, you know, kind of vulgarities, unless you understand that there were serious problems with liberal modernity, uh, or at least there were social conditions within liberal modernity that lead to the emergence of these kinds of attitudes. They didn't appear externally, right? They were kind of uh, baked in potentials uh, in people like, say, John Stuart Mills, or in the emergence of capitalism, or in the rise of liberal institutions, uh, and we can get into that somewhat later. Uh, but I want to kind of take a step back here to stress what I think you're getting at, which is that people, I think, react very viscerally uh, to the skeptical dimensions that they associate with postmodern thinkers. And I want to add myself to that list, right? Because again, uh, I've written a lot about postmodernity, and for the most part, I don't like it. And I don't like uh, 
the thinking that's associated with it. Because, you know, there are people who will point out, look, um, skepticism, you know, has a long, proud tradition uh, in Western thought going all the way back to Socrates, right? Uh, you know, Socrates sat there and he pissed people off by deconstructing their myths, deconstructing, you know, their meta narratives, if you want to call it that, uh, pointing out that the value systems of the city weren't things that people could actually defend systematically. Uh, aren't, you know, the kind of postmodern thinkers just doing the same thing? Well, not quite, right? Because Socrates always was critical uh, of these kinds of doxa uh, in the name of a higher truth, right? This idea that, look, we have to kind of be ruthless on our value systems, uh, not because, you know, there's nothing, you know, that sustains them, uh, but because, you know, by being ruthless to them, we're kind of clearing away the moss uh, in order to get to the gems, right? Uh, whereas for a lot of these postmodern thinkers, let's use Richard Rorty for an exa as an example, right? Uh, the end conclusion to a lot of their thought is, look, you know, we can just abandon the idea of truth, right? Uh, truth is, you know, a convenient fiction, right? Uh, it's a narrative that we tell ourselves uh, when certain kinds of value systems or certain kind of epistemic outlooks uh, happen to be useful for solving human problems for a reasonably long period of time, right? Uh, but, you know, truth might, you know, what we consider to be true uh, might be sustainable for a certain period of time, uh, but then we'll find a more useful way uh, of looking at things, Uh no, in the course of time. Uh, and the example Rorty gives, drawing upon Thomas Kuhn, uh, is, you know, take Newtonian physics, for example, right? Uh, for many people starting in the 17th century, Newton, you know, unspooled the mysteries of the universe, right? Showed us the language of God, if you want to call it that. Uh, well, you know, Rorty said, actually, what he gave us was a pretty useful way of looking at things for a long period of time. Uh, but then, you know, we have Einsteinianism, in particular the quantum mechanics, uh, that basically showed that there were fundamental problems with ca classical physics, right? Uh, particularly its notions of determinism uh, and, you know, the role that the subject plays in framing uh, our understanding of the universe. Uh, and, you know, so we've replaced, you know, this old Newtonian paradigm of looking at things with a more useful one. Uh, and, you know, over a long enough period of time, you know, that too will be abandoned uh, by another more useful way of looking at things. Uh, well, I just don't agree with that, right? I do think that science progresses uh, in certain kind of fundamental ways. I think that Rorty is on to something uh, when he says we shouldn't suggest that there's a kind of clean through line uh, from one scientific to develop, uh, development to another. Sometimes there are radical breaks, but I see those as progressive breaks, right? Uh, where, you know, building upon what happened before, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, to use Newton's phrase, uh, you know, Einstein and Bohr and all these other figures, uh, raise science to a higher level of sophistication than it did before. But they wouldn't have been able to do that without the accomplishments of those who had came before. Uh, so there's something that's really uh, dissatisfying uh, about this kind of postmodern idea that everything is just about use, convenient fictions, narratives, illusions uh, that are helpful, that kind of thing. Uh, and I don't blame people. And in fact, I sympathize with them when they react strongly against it. Uh, all I'd like to say is that the argument is typically a lot more sophisticated than say what Jordan Peterson would have you believe, uh, or even Steven Pinker would have you believe. Uh, so what I would just like people to do is take it seriously. Uh, and I also would add that I think that there are uses to these arguments, much like there were uses to Socrates going around pricking at the pretensions uh, of you know different figures in Athens. Uh, because sometimes it's useful to have your presuppositions challenged uh, in a very fundamental way, uh, because it inspires you to think more seriously about the kind of things that you just took for granted in your epistemology or in your value system and to try to articulate a more sustainable defense of them in the future. Yeah, I think one of the ways that I think about that is I agree that the postmodernism in in this overstated sense and and in a way that's overstated by a lot of, you know, it, it is it is overstated in that way by a lot of postmodernists. Oh, definitely, yeah. Goes too far, but I think a lot of the arguments to the contrary about no, it's just it's just truth, and we just we find truth, we find knowledge. It's an objective process, and so on, are also overstated and often used in a rather cynical way. And so I analogize it to there's this G.K. Chesterton has Chesterton's Fence, which for uh, you know for listeners who aren't familiar with it is is this kind of argument for ultimately like a G.K. Chesterton is quite conservative. It's a, it's a conservative argument that says, you know, you come across, you're out wandering and you come across a fence that someone has built and you think, you know, like that fence doesn't seem to be have any purpose. I'm going to tear it down. And his argument is, wait, like someone someone put up that fence for a reason and it's been there for as long as it has 
for a reason. And maybe that reason isn't any good. Maybe it was never good. Maybe it's not good anymore. Maybe the fence, in fact, should be torn down. But don't tear it down until you know what that reason is and you've thought about it and you've examined it because it could be that the fence looks like it serves no purpose to you right now, but in fact, it the, the reason still obtains. It still is a good one. And, and that argument on its face sounds quite reasonable. You know, like, yes, of course, you should you should try to figure out why that thing is there, why that tradition exists before you tear it down. But in application, it feels like 99 times out of 100 that someone would cite Chesterton's fence. It's not this kind of epistemically humble, let's actually like interrogate the reason for the fence and see if it's a valuable one, but instead a a kind of just reactionary argument of this is a way for me to not have to have a conversation about why we still have that fence. I can just say Chesterton's fence is, you know, like this tradition, this this social hierarchy, this grand narrative that is, you know, socially beneficial to me or makes me comfortable at the expense of others. We can buffer it from criticism by way of just pointing to Chesterton's fence. And and I feel like a lot of that goes on too with the pushback on some of the postmodern arguments is that yes, of course, science progresses. Yes, of course, there are there are facts that science uncovers and that's why it accomplishes all the amazing things that it accomplishes. But there are also ideologies at work. There are, you know, scientific truths that Scientific racism, which is still there, is still an unfortunate number of people who are really oh, big sure. into <laughs> science and IQ research, and so or or race and IQ research for reasons that look. What do they say? Somewhat, I'm just asking questions, you know. Uh, yeah, like just asking questions. There's and so saying, like, wait a second, you can talk in the language of just pursuing objective facts, but there's more going on. Here, there are there are ideological things that can be going on. There are narratives. There's mythologies. There's so on, and we should critically examine them. And maybe we come to the conclusion that yes, in fact, what you're doing or what this is is just truth seeking. But it feels like kind of a buffer for defense of hierarchies and narratives, and so on. And so we should take. I don't know. We should take these postmodern arguments, I think, more seriously than a lot of people do, especially when they are targeting those things that we personally, those those myths, those power structures, those beliefs about nature and what's natural, particularly about people and society and identity and so on, and and be willing to critically examine in the ways that the postmodernists might be overstating, but still are kind of demanding that we do. Oh, absolutely. And this is where things get really complicated, right, uh, in terms of the political implications uh, of postmodernism. Uh, so I'll just start by saying that I think what you said is very interesting, because one of the things that I find so amusing uh, about a lot of the responses to postmodern arguments uh, is in many senses, they actually reflect uh, what Nietzsche talked about. And Nietzsche was a foundational figure for many postmodern uh, thinkers uh, when he said, you know, our commitment to truth isn't really about truth. It's about values, right? Uh, we don't want to see our values deconstructed because we're aware that they are ultimately both foundationless and necessary, right, in order to save us from these kinds of nihilistic anxieties. Uh, because so often, the arguments that I see made against the postmodern thinkers, even when they're raising epistemic or metaphysical claims, uh, are morals, are moral objections, right? Uh, well, if we buy into this epistemic skepticism, then we're going to be uncertain about how the world operates, and I can't tolerate that because I need to know how the world works. Uh, ergo, you know, postmodernism uh, has to be untrue. Uh, or if our value systems are challenged and deconstructed this way, then it leads to these kinds of nihilistic conclusions uh, about value systems in general. Uh, we can't have that because it's socially irresponsible, so we need to put a stop to that. Uh, and my response to that is, well... What about their arguments? Actually, what about the content of what they're saying, right? Uh, maybe it is the case that your epistemology is really deeply flawed. Uh, maybe it is the case that your value system isn't built upon a secure enough foundation. Uh, you can't just hand wave that away by saying, well, the consequences of adopting this view morally or epistemically are really bad, so I don't accept it. Develop a better value system, right? Develop a better epistemology, right? Uh, and this is, again, where I want to dive into the politics uh, of this, because a very interesting set of transitions uh, have occurred 
over the course of modernity in relation to a lot of these different outlooks. Uh, it's very much worth noting, and Terry Eagleton, the great Marxist thinker, stresses this excellently in his uh, critic uh, criticism of postmodernity called um, The Illusions of Postmodernism, uh, where he says, look, the funny thing about this all uh, is if you were to go back to the 18th century uh, and ask, you know, who around here is making skeptical arguments about reason, uh, arguing that, you know, all value systems are ultimately contingent and grounded in history uh, and that we should be wary uh, of meta-narratives, uh, well, it would almost invariably be people within the conservative tradition, right? People like Evan Burke, Joseph de Maistre, you know, what have you, right? Uh, all of whom mobilized uh, these kinds of arguments against the Enlightenment, saying, look, uh, all of these liberal and radical philosophers are claiming that reason tells us how we can reconstruct our society uh, or that these traditions that we rely upon don't have any kind of secure foundation. Uh, but actually, you know, look, uh, the foundation for our value systems lies in history. This is contingent and different everywhere that we go. Uh, and any attempt to kind of use reason to scrutinize these uh, is inherently dangerous because reason has very, very impotent kinds of powers. Uh, and what it takes to be universal truths are actually just the fantasies of its own imagination, right? Uh, and you don't need to take my word for it. You know, you can go read Joseph de Maistre where he says, uh, what the Enlightenment calls philosophy is fundamentally a destructive force because it removes people's faith and convictions uh, around the societies into which they are born, right? Uh, and Eagleton's point is to say that a lot of people like, say, Michel Foucault, uh, make very similar sounding arguments today, uh, except now with a kind of progressive left bend. Uh, and I'm actually quite sympathetic uh, to that argument, right? Uh, but more broadly, right, uh, it is important to recognize that a certain kind uh, of skepticism of meta narratives uh, and skepticism of received truths uh, can also be conceived in liberal terms, right? Uh, so there's also, you know, a kind of liberal uh, anticipation of postmodernism uh, that, you know, is put forward by people like, say, Kant or even John Stuart Mill, right? Now, a lot of people might react very strongly against this, uh, but other kinds of conservatives who aren't historicists, like Peter Lawler, have pointed out uh, look, you know, once upon a time we had this old, Aristotelian worldview uh, and scholastic worldview that everyone took for granted, uh, where everything in the universe was seen as being ordered by God. It had a purpose, a telos to it, uh, and human reason uh, with a combination of faith was seen to be sufficient to understand that. Uh, well, along come people like Kant, and along come people like John Stuart Mill, and along come people like Descartes, uh, and they say, well, no, actually, uh, the universe doesn't seem to have any kind of telos to it. If there is a purpose to the world out there, it's just one that human subjects ascribe to it. Uh, and related to this is the idea that, look, actually, value systems aren't handed down to us by nature or handed down to us by, say, God, for example. Uh, they're things that human beings create, uh, or at least they're the products, if you want, uh, of human reason and human cognition, right? Uh, and this, of course, you know, can anticipate in a lot of ways various kinds of postmodern arguments, right? Where Nietzsche, for instance, will say, uh, well, you know, once we accept Kant's idea that values aren't handed to us by nature or by God, uh, they're just created by human reason or human cognition, uh, then we can recognize that all value systems are just, you know, again, useful fictions, uh, or not so useful fictions in Nietzsche's terms that we tell ourselves, right? Uh, and so, and, you know, John Stuart Mill, also, you know, great skeptic, uh, argues that what we should endorse are experiments in living uh, because every person is different. Uh, and this idea that there's some universal good that all human beings pursue rather than a variety of different forms of the good life uh, that different people might want to pursue. Uh, well, again, you can cast that in Foucauldian terms, right? This idea that, you know, experiments and living are good things. We should resist the forces of domination that impede us uh, to create more space uh, for, you know, free experiments and living, right? Uh, what I think differentiates these kinds of mature enlightenment arguments from their postmodern bastardizations, uh, and this is the kind of view that I hold, uh, is that, you know, Kant and Mill would say, uh, yes, it is the case that we should be skeptical of many forms of received wisdom. Uh, yes, it is the case that we have to recognize that values aren't handed to us on high. Uh, there's something that human beings and human reason creates. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we, can throw, we should throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, because we can actually offer constructive arguments uh, for why it is that one should endorse this value system over another because it's utility maximizing, right? Uh, or respects human dignity in certain kind of fundamental ways. Uh, or because, you know, I'm a Rawlsian, right? Uh, it's what would be agreed to in the conditions of the original position, yada, 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 yada. Uh, and that's the view that I think I, you know, hold to, uh, and I think is the most responsible one that people should adhere to. 
but, you know, it's important to note that these liberal arguments can mutate uh, into these postmodern forms. Uh, and any sophisticated commentator on postmodernity would say, you have to be dialectical about this and recognize that the skepticism induced by liberal societies and this idea that each person should be free to live by their own value systems, uh, of course, can be taken too far uh, into these kind of postmodern directions. So, you know, let's be careful uh, in recognizing that. It was all I would want to say. Is there a skeptical read on, or or I guess a cynical read on what you just said and the way you talked about these ideas manifesting among conservatives during the Enlightenment and then shifting to, you know, the 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 postmodernists of the you know its its emergence in the the seventies and eighties um, are very much on the left, or the far left. That effectively, what's going on here is when you like the the dominant paradigm, the dominant ideology, the dominant myths, the dominant sense of what is natural and moral and so on, so you like where society is, then arguments that come along that destabilize that or critique it um, or say maybe it's not as rational as you've made it out to be, maybe it's not as objective as you've made it out to be, you're going to push back pretty hard on and say these are unreasonable. But when you're in the position where you don't like so you're you're in you don't like the direction things are going. Um, you don't like where things are. You're in one of the marginalized groups, or your you know your sympathies are with a marginalized or oppressed groups. Then you're going to argue the opposite, which is we need to you know the 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 arguments, the structures that that prop up the existing regime. And distribution of values and beliefs and so on don't actually work. We should have, we should be kind of more radically skeptical. But then if you get your way, you suddenly you're gonna become a conservative again and say, no, what we've got now is the is the objective, obvious truth. These are the structures that are real. That's a fantastic question. And actually, I'm writing a fair bit about that right now uh, in my new book on liberal socialism, where I'm going to chastise um, the left for abandoning the Enlightenment and its optimistic view uh, of human reason, right? Uh, which I think was conducive or certainly essential uh, in providing affective motivation uh, for pursuing liberal socialist goals. Uh, but let's just put it this way, right? Uh, I think that skeptical arguments and skeptical positions are endorsed by political ideologies when they see themselves on the back foot. Uh, rightly or wrongly, right? So let's just take Burke and de Maistre as a good example, right? Uh, they were writing at the time of the French Revolution uh, when it looked like a kind of radical Enlightenment liberalism and republicanism uh, was everywhere. The intellectual vanguard, uh, these figures understood themselves to be the intellectual vanguard also and would appeal to things like truth and universal rights and, you know, the dignity of all human beings. Uh, and so consequently, what did, you know, Burke and de Maistre uh, or, you know, a wide array of other reactionaries do? Uh, well, they became skeptics, right? They pricked holes uh, in the kind of universalistic aspirations uh, of many of these figures, right? Uh, and, you know, let's flash forward, you know, to the 19th century. Uh, eventually, you know, socialists, along with liberals, start to think uh, that they're the vanguard of the future. So you have a mature Enlightenment figure like Marx come along, uh, claiming that, look, the utopian socialists uh, were wrong and just putting forward these moral arguments uh, for why socialism or communism is a good thing. Uh, actually, I've scientifically shown, you know, uh, that the contradictions inherent within capitalist society are going to lead to the emergence of, you know, socialism and then communism. Uh, and we can take this for granted. Right. Uh, there's a lot of confidence. I would say way too much confidence that comes in to making those kinds of predictions. Right. Uh, and I would agree with anybody who would say, well, that wasn't going to come to pass. Right. Uh, but, you know, this emerges uh, from this sense that socialism is the way of the future. So socialists don't have to be skeptics. Right. Uh, or they don't have to just be critics. They can confidently project their ideal into the future. Uh, but then something very unusual happens uh, in the 20th century that I think is just starting to be reformulated now uh, or well understood now. Uh, so Sam Moyne has a really good book about Cold War liberalism, uh, where he points out that What's interesting about liberalism in the 20th century uh, is for all many liberals uh, 
claim not to like postmodernism, uh, many of the iconic liberals uh, of that century also endorsed various kinds of skepticism uh, or these resigned views towards history, right? Uh, and you don't need to tell me that. You know, think about somebody like F. A. Hayek, right? Uh, F. A. Hayek was also, you know, very much an epistemic skeptic. Uh, one of his core arguments, of course, is this idea that we can fully understand the world and consequently fully remake it uh, is deeply problematic. Uh, and so instead, what we should do is defer uh, to the accumulated wisdom uh, inherent within liberal uh, institutions. Uh, and we should also recognize that the market uh, plays a valuable role in basically organizing human interests in a way that is conducive to human utility, uh, but is not necessarily transparent uh, to us and certainly cannot be controlled by planners, for example. Uh, or, you know, you can go forward to somebody like uh, Isaiah Berlin, right? Uh, where Berlin also advances kinds of very skeptical arguments about things like positive liberty, uh, for example, saying, look, you know, it might be nice to aspire to a degree of positive liberty, uh, and we shouldn't necessarily downplay uh, its importance. Uh, but we also recognize that all efforts to try to rationally pursue positive liberty so far uh, have been at the very least dangerous, uh, and in some cases, outright disastrous. Uh, so we might have to just rest with the view that negative liberty is all that we can achieve safely, right? Uh, and these kinds of skeptical arguments obviously aren't iterated uh, in a postmodern idiom, uh, but they contain the same kind of germ of pessimism that you would see in people like Michel Foucault or Jacques Derrida. And of course, on the left, particularly after, um, you know, the Hungarian invasion, May 1968, the realization that, you know, uh, Maoism uh, was a catastrophe, uh, you start to see many on the left also adopt this extremely pessimistic attitude uh, that's in sharp contrast to Marxist optimism, right? Uh, and, you know, Jean-François Lyotard, who I know you're familiar with, is a great example of this, where he goes from being a Marxist to writing a book about the condition of postmodernity, saying Marxism is just another meta narrative. It's failed. Uh, clearly, we're not move, moving towards, you know, this benighted future uh, that Marx talked about. Uh, so the best we can do is engage in local kinds of struggles. By contrast, though, uh, what you really start to see starting in the 1950s and 60s is conservatives, oddly enough, uh, dropping a lot of the more skeptical arguments that they had leaned very heavily on for a long time, including uh, much of the early 20th century, uh, and steadily adopting much more universalistic, confident kind of language as they surge in political power, right? Uh, and you don't need you know, to take my word for it. Uh, think about somebody like Ronald Reagan, right? Uh, by the time, you know, Ronald Reagan gets into office, uh, he's citing, of all people, Thomas Paine, you know, the great social democratic revolutionary, uh, saying, you know, we have it in our power to remake the world anew, right? Uh, very anti-Hayekian sentiment, uh, I should also add, right? Uh, but this reflects, again, this confidence on the part of many conservatives uh, that we're it. You know, we hold, you know, the kind of universalistic value system. We understand what truth is. Uh, we have the right formula. Uh, and so we don't need to be skeptics any longer. We can be confident uh, in asserting the importance of, say, American power or the supremacy of Western civilization, right? Uh, so I think that skepticism uh, has, for the most part, been not particularly helpful for many progressive liberals uh, and those on the left. Uh, and I think, frankly, it's time to get rid of it. Uh, because I think while it can be conducive to producing very interesting critical projects, right? Uh, and again, I want to stress, I do think that, you know, a lot of these projects are quite interesting, right? Uh, it's not very helpful in motivating people to commit themselves to a positive kind of politics, uh, which is what I think really we need right now, at least from my standpoint. To close this out, you mentioned at the beginning or earlier on in our conversation that even if people react viscerally against postmodern ideas, they should they should look to the arguments themselves because the arguments are often more sophisticated than they're given credit for. How do you recommend people do that? And I, I ask that specifically because one of the seemingly just fundamental characteristics of the postmodernists is they're awfully difficult oh, yeah. to read that, you know, don't pick up a book by Derrida and it's, it's like, it may be more opaque than you mentioned Joyce than like Finnegan's wake. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and yeah. they all, none of them are particularly clear writers. So, how do we how does one like okay i want to i want to learn more about postmodernism where do i begin 
Yeah, that's a great question. And look, I completely agree with you, right? Uh, I mean, I enjoy thinking through some Deridian ideas. I don't agree with him about, you know, 99% of stuff, uh, but he's always thought provoking. Uh, but boy, oh boy, when I was reading of grammatology, did I just want to throw that book against the wall or burn it or, you know, you, you know, you, you take, you, you know, you choose, right? You know, throw it in the trash, chuck it in the river. You know, it's just, it's a very, very annoying text to read. Uh, I would suggest for your listeners who are interested in a kind of sophisticated take on this uh, to read Richard Rorty, right? Um, so Richard Rorty was deeply sympathetic to figures like Derrida or Wittgenstein or um, Heidegger. And uh, he writes in a much more clear, uh, even pleasant way, uh, I should add. Uh, in particular, if you want a good book that is um, emblematic uh, of this outlook, uh, Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity uh, is a good one. Uh, or you can read his book, uh, Philosophy and Social Hope, which is a collection of essays where he comments on a lot of these issues. And again, you know, they're sparklingly well written, right? Uh, if anything, you know, some of them were published in newspapers for reasons, you know, they're just really, really well written. Uh, and, you know, don't always trust what he says about Foucault and Derrida, because like everyone else, he's offering his interpretations of them. Uh, but, you know, he offers a kind of um, distillation of a postmodern attitude that's a lot more clear than what you can find uh, in a lot of those uh, French thinkers. Uh, if you want another book that um, is clear, even though it was uh, repudiated by you know, its author, uh, The Condition of Postmodernity, Leotard's book, uh, isn't the hardest thing in the entire world. Um, certainly, you know, by the standards of French theory, it's not that difficult. Uh, and, you know, Leotard later said, you know, there are deep problems with the book. You know, I don't like it. Uh, but for anybody who wants to understand what all this talk about meta narratives or grand narratives is, um, you know, it's really the essential place uh, to start, I would say. Uh, and, you know, for those who are looking for um, good criticisms of postmodern thought, um, I'll offer, uh, I'll give two. Uh, so I would suggest uh, reading, um, if you're interested in kind of left perspectives on this, uh, pick up Terry Eagleton's Illusions of Postmodernism. Uh, again, a very good, very sharp Marxist critique of postmodernity, uh, which is also one of the things that I wanted to come on here and say, because this is a pet peeve. Uh, people will sit there being like, you know, postmodern neo-Marxism or postmodern Marxism, uh, you know. Marxists despised uh, postmodernism precisely because, you know, all these postmodern figures were like, you know, Marxism is the great grand meta narrative of, you know, modernity needs to be rejected. And, you know, they all had uh, problems with that. Uh, so The Illusions of Postmodernity uh, or Postmodernism by Terry Eagleton, very lucid, very clear book. Um, and if you're looking for a good liberal uh, critique, uh, again, of the problems with postmodernity, uh, I would strongly recommend reading Charles Taylor's uh, Sources of the Self. Um, it's a big book. It's very dense, uh, but it's also quite lucid, right? Uh, and, you know, you'll also pick up a really good uh, view of the history of Western philosophy when you can go through it. Uh, and what's nice about Taylor is he's kind of even handed about this, where he's like, you know, liberals need to accept that there were some reasons why postmodernity and modernity emerged that are, you know, bad. Uh, and, you know, they can't be laid at the feet of other kinds of movements. Uh, but also, let's not throw the Bible out with the bathwater. There's some good things about this as well. You know, again, this capacity to engage in experiments and living is something that any liberal should want to get behind, right? Uh, and it's you know something that postmodernism or you know, hypermodernity or whatever you want to call it really radicalizes in certain kinds of ways. Oh, or better yet, um, if you want, uh, go watch Seinfeld. Uh, Seinfeld is often taken to be like the quintessentially uh, postmodern show. Uh, you know, there's good reasons for that. You know, the show about nothing. So if you want postmodern aesthetics, then you know go go through the nine seasons of that, and you'll get a pretty good sense of uh, how this trickles down into the more general culture. Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. If you like the show and want to support it, head to reimaginingliberty.com to learn more. You'll get early access to all my essays, as well as be able to join the Reimagining Liberty Discord community and book club. That's reimaginingliberty.com, or look for the link in the show notes. Talk to you soon.